Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first of a series on controlling and shaping light. Now, it may be obvious or cliche, but we all know that photography is about light. Light's our medium, our paint. It's our photographic canvas, if you will. My name is Joe Brady, and I'm here to lead you on this series, and we're going to explore. We've got some uh, interface stuff to show you. You can chat with us live, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. Now, how we evaluate, control, and measure light can have an enormous effect on the look and quality of our images. To create great images, you need to know how to shape the light on your subject. Knowing when to add additional light and seeing when to subtract light are the aspects of lighting control that will add shape and dimension to your photography. Now, back in the day, photographers like me had to lug wagon loads of equipment uphill in both directions through deep snow in bare feet. No, never mind. What I'm really getting at is that many people thought once handheld meters became obsolete, once exposure systems showed up in cameras, everyone thought a meter wasn't necessary. Turns out that's not the case. I'm starting to see a renaissance in handheld meters because people are tired of a couple of things happening. First, they're missing the shot. The exposure is a little bit off, and you're missing that important moment. I can't remember a photographer who said it, but one of the important things is to capture the moment in between the moments, and those can be the great shots. I'm seeing way too much exposure bracketing and chimping. Chimping is a term people use when you're constantly looking at the back of your camera to see if you got the right shot. And I'm also seeing way too much editing, way too much, well, I can fix that in Photoshop later. No one is paying you to fix your images in front of the computer, and if you get them right from the beginning, it will save you a lot of time, and it's going to give you a much better image. Why is this happening? Well, your in-camera meter, as sophisticated as they've got, they might be trying to do a little bit too much. Digital cameras have less exposure latitude than in the old days of film, and using a handheld light meter now is more important than ever. Pros and amateurs alike are now seeing that they need to accurately measure the sh to shape the light in a scene. And that's a major step towards improving your photography. Now, before we get any deeper, let's take a look at the chat screen for those of you that haven't found it yet. Now, you see this big blue call out button on the left side of the screen. If you click on that, that will open up the chat window. And you just give us a screen alias, whatever name you want to be called on screen. Fill that in, and then when you do that, you'll have the chat window show up. And there's an interface down on the bottom where you can enter your questions there. So that's how you communicate with us. Now, there's a lot of folks joining us today. I doubt we're going to be able to answer all your questions, but we will take a couple of breaks and answer questions as best we can. Now, one other thing. We're not going to talk about this today in any detail, but I want to just discuss monitor calibration real quickly. Your monitor is your window to everything you're doing. And if you're going to really be viewing accurately what is either coming through in video or when you're editing your images, your monitor really should be calibrated and profiled. If you don't, chances are you're going to be editing something that is going to be wrong. Understand that during today's presentation, underexposed images may appear better than they are if your monitor brightness is set too high. And conversely, overexposed images are going to look even worse. If you consistently get back prints from your lab or off your printer that are way too dark, there's a good chance your monitor is too bright. So you might want to join me on one of the monitor calibration webinars uh, that I also do, and we'll send you a link to that after the fact. So again, let's get back to this light meter before we start shooting. Why should you use one of these? Well, they're not just about exposure. They put you in control of shaping the light because they can tell you the exact amount of light falling on different areas of your subject. Your camera meter can only take back what it is reflecting off the subject. And that's its one of its major weaknesses. It's only capable of giving you an average of the scene. And it calculates that out to be around 18% gray. Now, since it's measuring reflected light, it's influenced by the color and tone of the subject you're photographing. Now, incident and reflective light is a very important concept. So let's watch a short animation that does a little better job of explaining the differences between incident and reflective metering. One of the core differences between your in-camera meter and using a handheld meter is the difference between reflective and incident metering. So let's get this topic really clear. Now, in reflective metering, which is what all of our cameras use, they're taking the light from the light source, in this case, be it the sun or some uh, artificial light, 
which is then illuminating the subject. But that's not the light that our camera is measuring. Our camera is measuring the light reflected back off the subject and that's what's coming through the lens and that's how our camera does its metering. Now this can work really well in some situations but not so well in other situations. It's also easily fooled. For example, say here we have our subject. We've got a sunny sun so we're going to use f16 at 1 125th of a second with 100 ISO. Now our subject is dressed in gray, she's medium skinned, dark hair but light, light clothing and our camera in this case gives us a very accurate reading. However, what happens if we're photographing someone in dark clothing with dark skin? Even though this person is illuminated by the same light, our camera gives us a different reading. In this case, it's still trying to average out the scene to 18% gray, and what it does is lowers the shutter speed, which in this case would result in an overexposure. Now conversely, if we've got a light-skinned person wearing light clothing, that same source is going to end up reflecting brighter, and our camera's going to try to counter it. So in this case, it's going to give us 1 250 of a second reading, which is going to result in an underexposure. Now incident meter reading is different and this is what our handheld meters do. In incident metering the incident light is measured at the subject where it's being illuminated to capture the actual amount of light illuminating the subject. So in this case regardless of our subject we're measuring the amount of light falling on it without regard to color, tone, etc. So what that means in this particular case is each of our subjects would have the exact same exposure reading and each of them would then have the correct exposure because it's not fooled by the color of the clothing reflecting back into the camera. All right, so we've seen that despite the sophisticated metering system in our cameras, they can still be fooled by scenes and lighting that doesn't offer sort of an average light. Now one other thing I just wanted to, to talk about real quickly is the histogram on your camera. Now we've all come to rely on the histogram and we were familiar with the little graph that shows up and what's overexposed and what's underexposed. However, you can't always trust it and what it will do sometimes is have an influence on how you are interpreting the scene. Let's take a look at a couple of examples first that will show this. Now this first one is a high key shot. High, it's very light background. Now if you judge the image by the histogram, you see this big mountain off to the right hand side of the graph and if you saw that on the back of your camera you would be very tempted to bring down the exposure even though for this scene that is a perfect exposure now conversely let's take a look at a low key scene with a dark background and here we see the graph is all the way pushed to the left again to be expected this is a perfect exposure for the shot but if you saw this on your camera you would be very tempted to bring the exposure up which would have ended up blowing out the bright side of the face. So kind of the moral of this story is that look at the histogram and compare it to the scene that's in front of you, but you've got to trust your meter. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up the meter. Now a couple of you have already asked questions about different meters. Uh, the meter we're using today is a Sekonic L308S. It's a very basic meter, it's very simple to use, and it's a great meter for using ambient light. In future sessions, we're going to work our way up the chain. The next session, we're going to use the, the Sekonic 358. Actually, for the next two sessions, we'll use that. And then on the fourth session, we're going to use the Sekonic 758, which, again, is the top of the line and allows us to do some more things. But we're going to keep some, some things simple today and use this. Now, we're going to set up the light meter first. Light meters out of the box come set in tenths of a stop increments. Now that's great for studio lighting and for those of you that are really up on f-stops, but not everybody is. And your camera typically is set for thirds of a stop increments. So we're going to set our meter for that. And it's very simple to do. I just hold the mode button and the power button at the same time. And it comes up and you can see on the front of the meter it says 1.0. That's tenths of a stop. If I hit mode again, it goes to 0.5, which is half stop increments. One more time and now we're in third of a stop increment. So now I just power off, and when I power back on, if I just take a quick reading, as I go up and down the scale, you can see the meter is moving in the same increments that your camera would be. And that'll just make it easy to match. Now, just a quick discussion about f-stops. I don't know how many of you are really up on f-stops, but understand the difference between a full f-stop, so 2.8 to 4 to 5, 6 to 8 to 11, et cetera. The difference between f8 and f6 is f8 is 
twice as much light hitting me as 5.6. So if I were to meter this side of my face and get a reading of F8 and read it this side and I get 5.6, that's one stop difference, which means there's twice as much light hitting here as here, and that would be a 2 to 1 lighting ratio. If it was F8 and F4, that would be a 4 to 1 lighting ratio. Don't get hung up on the math too much, but you do want to understand that lighting ratios will affect the kind of the look of your image, and it's going to affect the shape of the person's face. So why do we care about ratios? Well, a couple reasons. One, our camera does have a limited tonal range. From that average center reading, it can safely record up and down two stops, maybe a little more, getting close to two and a half. So what that means is if you take your center reading back to the camera, and your highlight reading is more than two stops, you're in danger of clipping out, of having an overexposure. So that's a part you need to control. Also, with lighting ratios, they're going to affect the shape of the face. A flatter lighting ratio, where the light is even on both sides, has a tendency to flatten the features. It will make somebody look wider, and I certainly don't need to be made to look any wider. A higher lighting ratio has the effect of slimming. So unless you have somebody with a very narrow face, chances are you're going to want to include that ratio. Now, higher ratios will bring out features. Lower ratios will flatten. They will also hide certain features. So if you're dealing someone with someone who's maybe a little older than I am who wants to hide some things, then maybe a flatter lighting ratio will work. Unfortunately, we don't have to photograph me and look at me. I've got my friend Susan here. And Susan, welcome. Nice to see you. Great to see you. Susan is our model for today, and she came in last week for a shoot that we can do a test. She's also a photographer. I am. And this is something that you guys should be doing if you haven't done. She's taken a big chance here, and she's stepping from behind the camera into front of the camera. And if you're trying to communicate with your subject what to do, it's really important that you spend some time in the camera, even if you hate pictures of yourself, as most photographers do. So do this, and it will help you communicate, and it will be more natural, and you'll be presenting less stress to them as well. So before we get started, there's two things we need to do. First thing is we need to white balance our camera. So since we're in a static set, since the light temperature isn't going to be changing at all, what I'm going to have Susan do is just hold this card. I'm using the Color Checker Passport to do a white balance. Now, I'm shooting with a Canon 5D today. And I do want to make sure first that my exposure is right. So I'm just going to take a reading back to the camera. And we're shooting at 800 ISO using one hundredth of a second today. So I'm going to set the camera at 6.3. That's what the meter told me. And I'm going to take a shot of the white target. Now, you don't have to fill the frame on these cameras, by the way. This is a question that comes up all the time. Don't I have to fill the frame with this white target? The answer is no. All you really need to do is fill that center circle. Then I go to the menu, and I go to where it has custom white balance as a choice, and I tell it to use the image that I just shot, and then set it on top of the camera. Now, this is one of those things, everybody's camera is a little different. If you shoot an icon, it might be handled differently. It doesn't matter. It might be one of those read the manual things. But it's really important, because now we know our white balance is perfect. Now, one last thing I'm going to do, and again, I'm not going to show how to actually complete this today, but I'm going to take a shot of the Color Checker Passport. The beauty of this is this will allow me to create a custom camera profile for today's shoot. One click and all of my color editing for the images will be done. It brings all my colors right into line. And if I was shooting multiple cameras, it will also allow each of the cameras to match. So I, once again, correct exposure. I don't have to fill the frame. And you can see where we've got our shot of the color checker. So now we're done with our prep. So now it's time to start shooting. Now, one last thing I'm going to do before I start shooting. And that's just want to address real quick facial analysis. Now, there's lots of different factors for facial, facial analysis. Everybody is slightly asymmetrical. If you were actually to take your face, a picture of yourself, cut it down the middle, and then paste the left to the right, you'd look pretty weird. But every, the asymmetry is what makes us all look interesting. Now, I look at Susan. She's very symmetrical. Most people have one eye that's a little bigger than the other, and the nose typically breaks towards one side. Nose direction is usually the most important, because most people's eyes are pretty close. 
the general is general rule is curve the nose towards the camera. So if I'm turned this way and my nose broke that way, I would want this side towards the camera. Because if it's away, actually I'll do it to Susan. I'll actually bend her nose. If I bend her nose away from the camera, it's going to make it look larger. And I don't think of anybody that actually wants their nose to look larger in a photograph. Another way to think of it is generally one side of the nose is straighter than the other, and you want the straight side on the shadow side of the image. Now, eyes, if the nose is very straight or very minor, if one eye is bigger than the other, you want to try to put the smaller eye towards the camera because that makes it look a little larger and then they even out. These are just kind of guidelines. They're not rules. You might find that just the opposite works for a certain subject, but it's a good starting point. So it's time to start metering. So again, we are working. We're just working with ambient light. We've got a big window over here. We've got our white background. Actually, we need to turn off our extra set light, Max, if you would turn that off for us. Okay, I may have got a little dingy. We just had a light on so that we could show, but we want to shoot just with ambient light. Oh, and by the way, before we go any further, we've got Rick behind the camera. We've got Max and Jen manning the console. In fact, Jen, say hi to everybody. Let's see you. All right, you guys are going to get to see Jen and her glory and her headphones. So there's Jen. today. They're actually running the show. So again, 800 ISO we're shooting at hundredth of a second. So that's what I have the meter set for. So when I'm metering, I want to make sure I'm not in the way. I don't want me to affect the metering. I don't want to stand in between the light. Also, that was reason why I wore a black shirt. I didn't want to have something reflective that was then going to add as a reflector and change the light. So what I'm going to do is take a meter reading here and towards the light. And I get, what do we got? Eight. We got F8 on the bright side. I come to the shadow side, and I've got 3, 6. So it's a lot of math, but F8 to 3, 6, let's see. That's one, two, and a third stops if I'm doing the math right. But what I'm mostly concerned with is the shot back towards the camera. So I take the reading there, and we get 6, 3. So that's a very safe setting because we're getting a 6, 3 exposure with F8 on the bright side. And remember, we have two stops of latitude up. So there's no danger in overexposing. Now, however, that's what our meter is telling us. We've got a little clouds going on out here, so we might have to re-meter every once in a while because the, uh, the light's changing. In fact, it just got a little darker in here. So let me just take another reading. And it did. Actually, Susan, let's take another step closer to the window. So we've got a passing cloud. All right. So we've got a little bit darker light. We've got... Uh, 5, 6 now. That's fine. When we come back to the camera, we've got 5, 6. Now, let's see what the camera tells us, however. What I'm going to put the camera on is it's on um, hundredth of a second, and I'm going to put it on shutter priority, so it's staying on hundredth of a second, and let's see what the camera gives us as a reading. So I come in and frame my shot, and it gives us, ooh, F9. So it came out really dark which is not what we're after. Remember, our meter told us 5, 6. So let's put the camera back on manual, set for 5, 6, and see what we get. So same shot, 5, 6, and now we've got a great exposure. Again, why is this happening? Because we have this big white background. The camera was trying to average it out to 18% gray. So since there was white there, it brought the exposure down. You've probably seen this if you've ever tried to shoot out in the snow because the snow is very reflective. You're going to get gross underexposures, and what people do is they chimp or they have to uh, underexpose by two stops. Again, if you have a meter, that all goes away. So let's try uh, something different. I'm going to step back even further and see what happens. So again, we've got the sun moving through some clouds. Back towards the camera, I now have 7-1, and let's see what the camera meter gives us. So again, I go back to shutter priority. I include more of the background. And ooh, F11. Since I included even more of the background, take a look, it got worse. It got even dingier because now it's got this background here. My meter reading for my camera, however, coming back, if things haven't changed, is 6.3 still. So I go back to manual. Set my camera on 6.3. Even with lots of background, again, nothing has changed. I get a perfect exposure. 
the whites are clean, we get a nice skin tone. Now, if this image you're seeing up there looks at all blown out, again, it's because your monitor's too hot, we're looking at a calibrated system, and everything is right on. All right, one time, I'm gonna move in closer again. If we move in closer, in fact, let's turn you a little towards the window this time. Mm -hmm. not, maybe not quite that much. Coming towards the window now, I'm going to zoom in a little closer. And since Susan has dark hair, it's going to try to change or affect the overall exposure for the camera. Again, we're going to check with the meter. Back to the camera. Now I'm getting 7.1. On my bright side, F8. On my shadow side, 3.6. So we've got a real dark side here. Is it OK if I move your hair a little bit? Just a little? OK. So let's and see what the camera does. So again, I'm going to move in a little bit closer. And the camera gives me F8. Eh, it's a little bit underexposed, you think? Yeah. It's a little dingy. It's making the background look dingy. Now, what I hear a lot here is, oh, I can fix this later in Photoshop. Yeah, you could, you can, but fixing an underexposed image like this is going to cause two things to happen. One, the skin tones are going to change. They're not going to be good. And secondly, the shadow, particularly on the dark side of her hair over here, the shadows, when you try to bring them up from being really underexposed, are going to get noisy and grainy, and that's not what we want. So let's put it back on manual, set our exposure, let's take another reading, let's see what we got now. Again, we got clouds moving around, so now it's F5. So I'll put my camera on F5. Again, come in and take the shot. And you can see, now we have a nice, clean look. Now, I also might want to make some changes with reflectors, which I'm going to bring in in a minute. Actually, Max, if you would get ready and just uh, get us a big reflector. Actually, let's try that right now. We're going to bring in a reflector to fill some shadows. Now, a reflector can do two things. It can fill in those shadows. It can even act as a second light source. Let me just grab this a second from you. So we have a really big reflector here. Now, this is silver on one side and white on the other. Um, some of you might have those gold reflectors. I'm not a big fan of them. Have you ever tried those? Yeah, too They're cool. way too yellow. One thing you can do, I'm told, is wash them. Oh. Throw them in the washing machine a couple of times and let them kind of get a little bit grungier. That'll take away some of that yellow. Now, since we're inside and not in direct sunlight, I'm going to use the silver side to give it a little more reflection. Typically, when I'm outside shooting, though, I will use the white side because the silver is a little too strong. So what I want to do is just soften this lighting ratio a little bit. If you grab that a second, Max. So again, let me get my reading here. So on the bright side, I've got F8. On the shadow side, I've got F4. That's pretty easy, 4 to 5, 6 to 8 exactly two stops. Now, Susan has a thin face, so maybe I don't want a real harsh lighting ratio on her. So let's bring in a reflector. Come on in here, Max. And actually, Rick, if you would zoom in on Susan's face a little bit. Susan, look towards me a smidge, right, right, right about there. And as we bring the reflector in, Watch, as I take it away, you can see the shadow on her face. As I start to bring it in, you just see it's filling in a little bit of the shadow. So if you'd hold that right there, Max. Thank you. And now we went from F4 to F5. So we've gained two-thirds of a stop by bringing in that reflector, which is lessening our lighting ratio. So now we're from five, F5 on one side to F8, which is a nice, much more gentle ratio. I've got 7-1 from the meter back to the camera. So again, I'm going to see, let's see what the camera does with the reflector here. The camera meter is giving us, ooh, F10. That's not good. We've got F10 now. That's a full stop under. The reflector was adding to it. We still have got all this light. What our meter told us was 7.1. So let's go back to put our camera on 7.1 and take our shot now. And now we get a nice exposure and our shadows are nice and filled in. When the pose and the lighting is good, you can use the reflector to just kind of soften the lighting and the shadows and give a little bit more gentle ratio. Again, it depends on the look you're going. If you want the drama, you do want a strong lighting ratio. If you want a little bit more of a gentle look, bringing in a reflector can fill. Now, Susan doesn't have this, but some people have deeper set eyes. 
So if that's the case, a lot of times what you want to do, let me just hold this horizontally, Max. If I'm doing a portrait out in the sun, I bring the reflector up underneath, which will fill in those eye shadows and kind of get rid of those raccoon eyes. Now, even as little as a third of a stop can make a big difference on an image, as is we're going to see. One third of a stop will make the background a little dingy. It'll make the clothes a little dingy and we'll lose a little bit of detail in the, in the hair. And again, trying to fix that, that's what's going to cause us trouble afterwards. Mm -hmm. So one more shot up close. Actually, Max, if you would bring the reflector underneath a little bit. Let's bring it right there. That's good. So again, I get my reading towards the window. I've got F8. Back towards there, I'm getting 3.6. So that's a little strong. Let's bring this up a little. All right, let's try that. We went from 3.6 to 4.5, so again, we gained two-thirds of a stop just by adding that reflector. And then back towards the camera, where, right where we left off, 7.1. So again, we'll put the camera on shutter priority and see what it tells us. Nice. But it gave us F9. So 7-1 to F9. Too much math, right? All right. She's the model today. She's the model today and the photographer. That's two-thirds of a stop. Again, fixable, but we don't want to have to fix it. Let's put the camera on 7-1 and get a perfect exposure. Nice. Right here, chin down, and just eyes at me. Oh, nice. That was nice. We got your little smirk going there. That was a good one. So when you get the exposure right on, again, it makes for great detail, great skin tone, and no noise in your image. Now, we're going to do one thing first. I'm going to send you off to get your black top on, because we're going to see what happens with this same set with the black top. In the meantime, do we have any questions there? I'm going to ask call out over to Jen over behind and see if we've got some questions. Go ahead. You can just speak it out. Ah, good question. Somebody asked how I calibrated the meter that it's accurate. These are actually pretty close. Um, for, these, for a meter like the 308, I'll let you in a secret. There's a simple way to do this. Any of you heard of, ever heard of Sunny 16? When you go outside at 100 ISO in the bright sun, you'll have F16. You can actually go outside and take a reading for that. If you don't already have a calibrated light source, which we do have here, uh, with the 758 meters, we can actually calibrate a light source, and we use that to calibrate this. But the short way is to actually go out in the sun, 100 ISO, F16, take a reading, and then there are adjustments uh, on the meters that you can calibrate them to. But it's a good question, though. Anything else? Some other people want to know why you're shooting at 800 ISO, not 100. Good question. Somebody, a lot of people ask, why am I shooting at 800 ISO, not 100? This is, even though we have a window light, it's a fairly dim room. And if I shoot at 100 ISO, in fact, let's do that. Let's, uh, let me change the ISO down to 100, and let's see what kind of readings I get here. Now, if I go to 100 ISO at 100th of a second, I'm getting a reading of 2.2. Well, my camera lens only opens up to 2.8. So there simply just isn't enough light in here. Now, these cameras nowadays at 800 are very clean, uh, provided you expose them correctly. When you do underexpose, you are going to have some noise to deal with. But if your exposure is right on, very little noise. Now, maybe I would do a compromise. Maybe I would set for 400 ISO. But I did find that for this particular setting, that um, uh, 800 ISO was a good result because it gave me a lot of depth. If I want to make sure Susan is in focus from nose to ear and her hair, then having an F7 or 5.6 is kind of the minimum if I want to go. If I went to a lower ISO, I would be wide open, and, and either her nose, tip of her nose would be out of focus or her ears, and that's not what I'm after today. But again, good question. When you're shooting ambient out in the sunlight, then yes, I probably would be shooting at 100 ISO. But since it's very dim in here, 800 was a compromise. But good questions. Anything else, Max? OK, let's continue on. Let's bring Susan back in. Hi. Susan's got a black top on. So what's that going to do? Now, it's not going to affect this. It's not going to affect my handheld meter. But my camera meter is going to be confused again, depending on how I frame her, how close in I am, how much background we use. So again, we'll take a reading. Oop, let me get my meter back to 800 ISO. 
so we can be consistent here. So I take a reading, I got the F8 and 3.6, and then back towards the camera, I've got, what have I got here? I've got F5. All right, so let's see what the camera says, however. So I'm going to put the camera again on shutter priority, and I'm going to frame Susan about half the frame, and at, let's see, what did we get here? I've got F7-1. So again, what is that? 5 to 7-1. 5 to 5-6 to 6-3 to 7-1. That's one stop. So we've got one full stop under. Again, makes things a little bit on the dingy side. Let's check our meter reading again, just to see, because again, we've got clouds moving around. And we get F5 now. So let's do F5. Set my camera meter for 5. So I'm, again, I'm on 100th of a second at F5. Same framing, same amount of distance and get a perfect exposure. And one thing you can check uh, on your cameras, you ever, you ever turn the blinkies on? Yeah. The highlight warning we always call the blinkies. If you put that on, it will let you know if you're overexposed. Little warning about that. It will go on if just one of the channels is overexposed. Oh, wow. It's red, green, or blue. I call the zebra. The zebra stripes, is a, that's what the video people call it. <laughs> on, on cameras, we, always, we used to call it the blinkies. It's a safety warning, though. It will let you know that you're either overexposed or getting very close, or at least one of the channels is overexposed. So again, we saw that with the black background, the black top and the white background. Even though it tried to help, we we're still off a bit. Now let's include more of the background and see what it does. So we'll put the camera on. Again, shutter priority. Now I'm going to add more background. And it comes up at 6.3. The in-camera meter did underexpose it again. So let's see what we get here. Again, back to our camera position, and we get F5. So 6.3 to 5, two-thirds of a stop. Not a huge amount, but it's still going to cause a difference. So let's go back to manual, to F5. Again, more of the background in. And you can see we get a nice exposure, just two-thirds of a stop causes a dramatic change in the detail, the tone, and the feeling of the photograph. Now, we're going to do a little set change. We're going to switch the white background to black. Now, in the meantime, I'm going to show you a short little video clip. Now, this is going to be an uh, outdoor shot. What do you do if the subject is wearing multicolored clothing and has a face that's white, brown, and black all at the same time? Creates some other problems, but you still got to trust your meter. Watch this. All right. We have our model. This is Buford, and Buford completely operates on treats. Very low wages, but he's very happy about that. So if I want to take a photograph of him, I just need to get a meter reading. So I want to get myself out of the way of the light. One of the things when you take a meter reading is you need to make sure that you are not interfering with the reading. Good boy, stay. So if I want to know the exposure for Buford, I simply come over here and take the reading and I get 125th at F9. That would be my exposure. Now I can take a side reading. I get F8, Buford. Hey. Hey. And I can take a bright reading on the other side. And I'm getting very even exposure here. I'm getting F8, F9. However, there's a real bright background behind him. And if I left the camera alone to do the exposure, he's going to end up underexposed and in shadow. Because the camera's going to have a tough time distinguishing between him and that bright background. By using a meter here, Hey, pay attention. By using a meter here and taking my reading, now the light's changed a little bit. I've got 125th at F8, and that's going to be a perfect exposure of a face that only a mother can love. Right? Take a look at the camera. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're a good boy. Yes, you are. Okay, so now we've got our black background. You saw what we're having with Buford there. And actually, before we start, let's take a couple of quick questions. Now, some of you asked about dome in versus dome out. The Sekonic 308 only does dome out. Yes, you can slide the dome off if you wanted to take reflective readings, but that's something I would never do. What you're talking about are meters like the 358 and the 758. And it's a good question. When you, dome out versus dome in. Generally, when you're going to be shooting back towards the camera, you're going to want to have the dome out because you want to measure all the light illuminating the subject. Dome in on those meters, and I'll show you this in detail in the next two seminars, 
dome in is if you really want to eliminate the influence of any other lights, particularly when you're dealing with studio lights. So if I have a light over here and I want to measure just its contribution, then I'll put the dome in because I don't want it to see the light coming from over here. That allows me to really control the ratios of my main light, my fill light, my hair light, my background light. Generally though, for a portrait photography for this, when you're taking your reading back towards the camera, it's going to be dome out. Dome in will be, again, when I'm doing my setup and I want to measure the contribution of each light. Good question. Anything else, Max? That's it for now. Okay, that's it for now. All right, so now we've got our black background. So let's get Susan back here. Now we have another problem. Remember that 18% gray averaging part we were talking about before? Well, again, the camera is going to still try to do that, but with a black background, it's going to try to overexpose because, again, it wants this to be 18% gray. We don't want that. So let's, again, take a reading here with our meter. Again, I've got 7-1 on the side. I've got 3-2. And then back towards the camera, I've got F5. But let's see what the camera tells us with its meter with this black background. So again, I'm on shutter priority. And I've got my black background. And ooh, that's ugly. 2.8, really overexposed because, again, it's trying to average the background. Let's see what happens when we put the camera on manual and listen to our meter and set it for F5. So I do the same thing. And F5, and again, the meter's not influenced by the color of the clothing. It's not influenced by the background, and it gives us the correct exposure. Again, if you looked at the histogram of this, in fact, let's bring that up real quick. I don't know if, how, if we could share it with everybody, yeah. Here, actually, I'm going to ask Rick if he can actually zoom into the back of the camera. Look at that histogram. It's entirely on the left-hand side. And if you were judging your image by what you see there, you're going to see that that's got to be wrong. That's what you're going to say to yourself. And it's actually perfectly right. So go by the meter. Trust it. Don't trust what's going on here. So again, we can change the framing. So if I move in closer to Susan, again, she's got light skin, although she was bad. When we did our pre-shots, which is the ones you're seeing today, we shot them last week, and then she went and did a vacation at the beach and was sitting out tanning herself. <laughs> so her skin's actually a little darker now than it was a week ago. But these supermodels, you know how they are. So what we're going to do by moving in close, since I'm going to have more of her face, it's going to be light against dark, but it's going to come out a little closer average-wise. Let's see what the camera does when I set it on shutter priority. Now I've got close-up on Susan, and I get 3.5. Okay, but now if you look real closely at the side of her face to the window, it's overblown. It's just gone. What we really need to do is see what the meter says back. So let's check. We've got a little bit change of the light here. We've got 6.3 now. So we'll set the camera on 6.3. Again, I frame in close. And I get a great exposure. Now, even with this, and I'll let Susan see this as well, you can see the exposure is good, but the histogram is still pushed way off to the left because it still sees all of that black back there. So that's why you can't completely trust what you're seeing on the histogram. Now I'm going to make it even worse. Susan, let's do uh, a floor pose here. So let's see. You're going to, yes. We're going to mirror that. So let's uh, fold your back leg up. All right. Good. Now, one thing I always do tell people, even though I'm old and crickety, sometimes it helps <laughs> to get down and mirror for your model and to show them what you want them to do. So we're going to kind of do this. The one leg behind, point your toes out a little bit. Just gentle, relax your arm. I see you still have your rubber band on your hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just right like this. Okay. All right, and chin down a little bit and relax. Another thing that's important is when you're posing, to make sure that the hands are relaxed. If you've got somebody who's really tense, it, it just doesn't look right. Relax the hands. Sometimes what I like to do, I learned this from a friend, Rick Farrow, who's a great portrait photographer, is just take their hands and... Relax. Make them, make them just kind of just hang there. Don't have the fingers bunched over. Don't let them uh, link the fingers like that because it ends up looking like some kind of strange creature. 
So, again, I'm going to get out of the way when I do the metering. Come here towards the light, and I get my readings. And the, again, the important one, back to the camera. And back to the camera says 5.6 against this dark background. Let's see what the camera tells us. I'm ex not expecting something good. Ooh, what did we get there? 2.8. Again, you can see it's grossly overexposed. This, as you can even see here on the floor here, is supposed to be black, but it's coming out kind of a mid-gray because the camera overexposed it. Go back to manual. I'm putting the camera on 5.6, which is what our meter told us. See as we look here. Nice. Tilt your head this way a little bit. Chin down a little. Gentle smile. Great. And, again, look at the histogram. Sure. You get an awful looking histogram. It looks all black. Again, you got to take into account what's going on with the background. It's a piece of it. You got to trust it. One real quick change, if you would just go jump and put on your white top on again. What we're going to do is we're going to have Susan put on the white top, which again is going to bring the average up a little bit, so the exposure in the camera should be a little bit better. Max, do we have any questions? Oh, uh, yeah. What lens are you using? Oh, good question. Somebody asked what kind of lens I'm using. This is a 5D, which is a full-frame camera. I'm using a 24 to 70 28 here, uh, partly because this set is, is kind of narrow. Now, Susan has very fine features. My favorite portrait lens is a 70 to 200. But if you're ever going to do full length, that's going to be too long. I use the uh, 24 to 70 primarily in 50 and higher. I don't like to go wide angle with portrait lenses because when you get too wide and when you get in too close, it has a tendency to flatten out features, makes them broader, and it's rarely attractive. What is your meter set to? What is my meter set to? Again, going back to that, my meter is set to 100 ISO at 1 100th of a second. And again, we're just doing ambient light. This meter, um, as simple as it is, is also capable of doing flash metering. And in our next session, when we start combining flash outdoors with ambient light, then we'll cover that. Anything else, Max? That's it for now. Okay, that's it for now. So let's get Susan back on the set. So Susan, we're going to do uh, actually flip you around the other way, that same kind of floor pose we just did. Good. All right. So let's get your face. Actually, scoot in a little bit. Now, I'm, I'm just looking with my eyes. I can see that there's a little bit maybe too strong a ratio here, so let's just meter that real quick. Max, I'm probably going to want you for the reflector. So I've got 7, 1, and 2, 2. That's a big, that's a big ratio. And 5, 6 back to the camera. So 5, 6 to 2, 2. 5, 6 to 4 is one stop. 4 to 2, 8 is two stops. 2, 8 to 2, 2 is another beyond that means my bl the shadows are going to get kind of black. So I want to soften the shadows up a little bit. So let's see here, Max. Now again, even you should be able to see this live. As I spin the reflector around, you can see, I reckon if you would zoom in a little more on Susan, you can see as I turn the reflector that it starts to fill in the side of her face away from the camera. And that's what we want. So Max, if you would hold that right there. Now I'll take a reading to see where we are. Now remember, we were 2-2. Just by adding that fill reflector, we went up to 3-6. So it's a nice gain of light. 5-6 to 3-6 is 1 and a third stops. That's a nice shadow ratio. Again, 7-1 up. And 5-6 back to the camera. So 5-6 is what we're going to want. Let's see what the camera gives us. So the camera with this lighting gives us, what did we get? We got F4. Better. We're closer. We're not as blown out as we were before. We were 2.8 before, if you remembered. Getting it a little closer with the white top brought the exposure closer, but still not where we want to be. Let's get our exact exposure. Take one more reading here. I've got F5, so I'll put the camera on F5. And let's take that shot. And again, you can see, I'll even share this with Susan, we can see we've got a nice exposure, but the histogram is still off. Now, that was one, that was two-thirds of a stop. Uh, darker, we had to go for the correct reading, but it makes the image perfect. 
Now, one last thing. We're going to move in close, fill in more of the image with the blouse, and see what the camera does for us. OK, so nice and close. And what have we got? We've got 3.5. Better. However, we ended up with this side. Actually, come on back live a second, Jen. And zoom in a little, Rick. We ended up with this side of the blouse from that last shot, ended up getting blown out, as did the side of her face. Jen, if you can show us that result again, the before. OK, so you can see that we ended up overexposed there. Now, the reading that we get with our, with our meter, again, shouldn't have changed. We got F5 still. So I go back to manual at F5, still framing nice and close. Take the shot. And again, I'll share it with Susan. Actually, I can even share it with you. Rick, go ahead and zoom in on here. I want to show you again the back of the camera. Again, how you can't trust the histogram. You can see the histogram is way to the left. But if you look at the thumbnail, we can see we've got a perfect result. One full stop difference, but it gave us that perfect exposure. So any other questions? Actually, Max, I'll take, the, I'll take this. Susan, let me help you up, darling. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great to have you here. I hope to have you join us again soon. So thank you. So let's sum up. What have we seen? We've seen the differences between reflective and incident metering. Reflective metering is what all your cameras do. They're just taking the light coming back. If you're out in an evenly lit scene, they do a really good job of it. But as soon as you throw something like this at it, a dark background, a white background, something with a lot of contrast, the meter gets too confused. As sophisticated as they are, they get confused a lot. We've seen that if you measure the lighting ratios, you can determine if you've got too much, bring a reflector in. When we go outside next time, we're going to use something called flags. We're going to actually stop the light, the sunlight, from hitting our subject so we can fill them in with flash. Max, have we got any other questions? No, I'm at, just to confirm the ISOs, my camera is at 800 ISO, 1 one hundredth of a second shutter speed, and that's what my meter is set at. They all match. So 100th of a second, 800 ISO, and what we did was we compared the metering reading their camera gave us with those settings versus the reading we got with the handheld meter, and you saw that they were very different in many cases. Any other questions? All right, that's kind of it for now. Uh, to let you guys know what's coming up. First of all, Thursday, August 11th, part two, which is going to be environmental portraits. Something that I hear about all the time that people have fits with is mixing outdoor flash with the ambient light. So that's really important because people have fits with that. And it's something that gives people a lot of trouble, especially if you're dealing with dappled sunlight coming through trees. We're going to tackle those issues, and we're going to see how the environment affects the portrait, how it tells the story, and how we can best control the light through the amb combination of ambient light and the flash. Now, the next one, part three, will be studio lighting. That will be Tuesday, August 30th. And there we'll be back in the studio, and we're going to be dealing with setting up lighting sets so that we can have, as I mentioned before, a fill light, a main light, a hair light, a background light, how to measure each of those and how to get just the look you want. And we're going to start it out with just one light. You'll be amazed with the dramatic portraits you can get using just that one light. And then part four will be landscape and HDR photography. And in part four, we're going to move up to the uh, Sekonic 758 meter, which allows us to read both um, incident light and spotlight. By doing that, we can figure out what's the brightest part of our scene, which is typically going to be a cloud, what is the deepest shadow, and we can determine the best exposure from that to make sure we get great landscapes, either using one shot or if we're going to have to use multiple shots. So for those of you that joined us late or had to leave early, which you wouldn't be hearing this, the broadcast has been recorded. It will live on the Sekonic site right where you are now. We will send everybody a follow-up email so that you can uh, review it, or if you wanted to share it with anybody, that would be great. And we will let you know as soon as it is posted. So that's it for me. Just to show you a quick summary, 
let's take a look at all the shots we did where you can see the before and afters. And until next time, everybody have a great rest of the week and a great weekend. Bye-bye.